Chapter Seven of the Last Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti. MikeVendetti.com. The Last Trail by Zane Gray. Chapter Seven. Westward from Fort Henry, far above the eddying river, Jonathan Zane slowly climbed a narrow, hazel-bordered mountain trail. From time to time he stopped in an open patch along the thickets and breathed deep of the fresh, wood-scented air, while his keen gaze slept over the glades nearby, along the wooded hillsides and above at the timber-strewn woodland. This June morning in the wild forest was significant of nature's brightness and joy. Broad-leaf poplars, dense-foliaged oaks, and vine-covered maples shaded cool, mossy banks, while between the trees the sunshine streamed in bright spots. It shone silver on the glancing silver leaf and gold on the colored leaves of the butternut tree. Dewdrops glistened on the ferns. Ripples sparkled in the brooks. Spider-webs glowed with wondrous rainbow hues, and the flower of the forest, the sweet pale-faced daisy, rose above the green like a white star. Yellow birds fluttered along the hazel bushes, caroling joyously, and catbirds sang gaily. Robins called, blue jays screeched in the tall white oaks, woodpeckers hammered on the dead hardwoods, and crows cawed overhead. Squirrels chattered everywhere, ruffled grouse rose with great bustle and a whirr, flittering like brown flakes through the leaves. From far above came the shrill cry of a hawk followed by the wilder scream of an eagle. Wilderness music, such as all this, fell harmoniously on the borderman's ear. It betokened the gladsome spirit of his wild friends, happy in the warm sunshine above or in the cool depth beneath the fluttering leaves, and everywhere in those lonely haunts, unalarmed and free. Familiar to Jonathan almost as the footpath near his home was this winding trail. On the height above was a safe rendezvous, much frequented by him and Wenzel. Every lichen-covered stone, mossy bank, noisy brook, and giant oak on the way up this mountainside could have told, had they spoken their secrets, stories of the bordermen. The fragile ferns and slender-bladed grasses peeping from the gray and amber mosses, and the flowers that hung from craggy ledges, and wisdom to impart. A borderman lived under the green treetops, and therefore all the nodding branches of sassafras and laurel, the grassy slopes and rocky cliffs, the stately ash-trees, kingly oaks and dark mystic pines, together with the creatures that dwelt among them, save his deadly redskin foes he loved. Other affection as close and true as this he had not known. Hearkening thus with single heart to nature's teachings, he learned her secrets. Certain it was, therefore, that the many hours he passed in the woods, apart from savage pursuits, were happy and fruitful. Slowly he pressed up the ascent, at length coming into open light upon a small plateau marked by huge, rugged, weather-chipped stones. On the eastern side was a rocky promontory, and, close to the edge of this cliff, a hundred feet in sheer descent, rose a gnarled, time and tempest twisted chestnut tree. Here the borderman laid down his rifle and knapsack, and half reclining against a tree, settled himself to rest and wait. This craggy point was the lonely watchtower of eagles. Here on the highest headland for miles around, where the bordermen were wont to meet, the outlook was far-reaching and grand. Below the gray splintered cliffs sheared down to meet the waving treetops, and then hill after hill, slope after slope, waved and rolled far, far down to the green river. Open grassy patches, bright little islands in that ocean of dark green, shone on the hillsides. The rounded ridges ran straight, curved or zigzag, but shaped their graceful lines in the descent to make the valley long purple-hued shadowy depressions in the wide expanse of foliage marked deep clefts between ridges where dark cool streams bounded on to meet the river 
lower where the land was level in open spaces could be seen a broad trail yellow in the sunlight winding along with the curves of the watercourse on a swampy meadow blue in the distance a herd of buffalo browsed beyond the river high over the green island fort henry lay peaceful and solitary the only token of the works of man in all that vast panorama jonathan zane was as much as lone as if one thousand miles instead of five intervened between him and the settlement loneliness was to him a passion other men loved home the light of woman's eyes the rattle of dice or the lust of hoarding but to him this wild remote promontory with its limitless view stretching away to the dim hazy horizon was more than all the aching joys of civilization hours here or in the shady valley recompensed him for the loss of home comforts the soft touch of woman's hands the kiss of baby lips and also for all he suffered in the pitiless pursuit the hard fare the steel and blood of a borderman's life soon the sun shone straight overhead dwarfing the shadow of the chestnut on the rock during such a time it was rare that any connected thought came into the borderman's mind his dark eyes now strangely luminous strayed lingeringly over those purple undulating slopes this intense watchfulness had no object neither had his listening he watched nothing he hearkened to the silence undoubtedly in this state of rapt absorption his perceptions were acutely alert but without thought as were those of the savage in the valley below or the eagle in the sky above yet so perfectly trained were these perceptions that the least unnatural sound or sight brought him wary and watchful from his dreamy trance the slight snapping of a twig in the thicket caused him to sit erect and reach out towards his rifle his eyes moved along the dark openings in the thicket in another moment a tall figure pressed the bushes apart jonathan let fall his rifle and sank back against the tree once more wetzel stepped over the rocks toward him come from blue pond asked jonathan as the newcomer took a seat beside him wetzel nodded as he carefully laid aside his long black rifle in the engine sign continued jonathan pushing towards his companion the knapsack of edibles he had brought from the settlement nary shawnee track west of this divide answered wetzel helping himself to bread and cheese lou we must go eastward over bing leggett's way to find the trail of the stolen horses likely and it'll be a long hard tramp who's in leggett's gang now besides old horse the chippewa and his shawnee pard wildfire i don't know bing but i've seen some of his engines and they remember me never seen leggett but once replied wetzel and that time i shot half his face off i'd been told by them as have seen him since that he's got a nasty scar on his temple and cheek he's a big man and knows the woods i don't know who all's in his gang nor does anybody he works in the dark and for cunning he's got some on jim girty dearin and several more renegades we know of lying quiet back here in the woods we never tracked as bad a gang as his'n. They're all experienced woodsmen, old fighters, and desperate, outlawed as they be by Injuns and whites. It wouldn't surprise me to find that it's him and his gang who are running this hoss leaving, but bad or no, we're going after him. Jonathan told of his movements since he had last seen his companion. And the last Helen is going to help us, said Wetzel much interested it's a good move women are keen betty put miller's scheming in my eye long afore i noticed it but girls have chances we men never get yes and she's like bets quicker than lightning she'll find out this hoss thief in fort henry but lou when we do get him we won't be much better off where do them hosses go who's disposing of em for this feller where's brant from asked wetzel Detroit. He's a French-Canadian. Wetzel swung sharply around, his eyes glowing like wakening furnaces. 
Bing Leggett's a French Canadian and from Detroit. Metzer was once thick with him down Fort Piney Way before he murdered a man and became an outlaw. We're on the trail, Jack. Brant and Metzer with Leggett back in them, and the horses go overland to Detroit. I calculate you hit the mark. What'll we do? asked Jonathan. Wait, that's best. We've no call to hurry. We must know the truth before making a move, and as yet we're only suspicious. This lass'll find out more in a week than we could in a year. But, Jack, have a care if she don't fall into any snare. Brand ain't any too honest a looking chap, and them renegades is hell for women. The scars you wear prove that well enough. She's a rare, sweet, bloomin' lass, too. I never seen her equal. I remember how her eyes flashed when she said she knew I'd avenged Mabel. Jack, their wonderful eyes, and that girl, however sweet and good as she must be, is chain lightning wrapped up in a beautiful form. Aren't the boys at the fort running after her? Like mad, it'd make you laugh to see him, replied Jonathan calmly. There'll be some fights before she's settled for, and maybe art of that. Have a care for her, Jack, and see that she don't catch you. No more danger than for you. I was catched once, replied Wetzel. Jonathan Zane looked up at his companion. Wetzel's head was bowed, but there was no merriment in the serious face exposed to the borderman's scrutiny. Lou, you're joking. Not me. Some day when you're catched good and I have to go back to the lonely trail, as I did afore you and me became friends, maybe then, when I'm the last borderman, I'll tell you. Lou, cordin' the way settlers are comin', in a few more years, there won't be any need for a borderman. When the engines are all gone, where'll be our work? Tain't likely either us that'll ever see them times, said Wetzel, and I don't want to. Well, Jack, I'm off now, and I'll meet you here every other day. Wetzel shouldered his long rifle and passed out of sight down the mountainside. Jonathan arose, shook himself as a big dog might have done, and went down into the valley. Only once did he pause in his descent, and that was when a creaking twig warned him some heavy body was moving near. Silently he sank into the bushes bordering the trail. He listened with his ear close to the ground. Presently he heard a noise as of two hard substances striking together. He resumed his walk having recognized the grating noise of a deer hoof striking a rock. Farther down he espied a pair grazing. The buck ran into the thicket, but the doe eyed him curiously. Less than an hour's rapid walking brought him to the river. Here he plunged into a thicket of willows and emerged on a sandy strip of shore. He carefully surveyed the river bank, and then pulled a small birch-bark canoe from among the foliage. He launched the frail craft, paddled across the river, and beached it under a breedy, overhanging bank. The distance from this point in a straight line to his destination was only a mile, but a rocky bluff and a ravine necessitated his making a wide detour. While lightly leaping over a brook, his keen eye fell on an imprint in the sandy loam. Instantly he was on his knees. The footprint was small, evidently a woman's and what was more unusual instead of the flat round moccasin track it was pointed with a sharp square heel such shoes were not worn by border girls true betty and nell had them but they never went into the woods without moccasins jonathan's experienced eyes saw that this imprint was not an hour old he gazed up at the light the day was growing short already shadows lay in the glens he would not long have light enough to follow the trail, but he hurried on, hoping to find the person who made it before darkness came. He had not traveled many paces before learning that the one who made it was lost. The uncertainty in those hasty steps was as plain to the borderman's eyes as if it had been written in words on the sand. The course led along the brook, avoiding the rough places, and leading into the open glades and glens but it drew no nearer to the settlement. A quarter of an hour of rapid trailing enabled Jonathan to discern a dark figure moving among the trees. 
Abandoning the trail, he cut across a ridge to head off the lost woman. Stepping out of a sassafras thicket, he came face to face with Helen Shepard. Oh! She cried in alarm, and then the expression of terror gave place to one of extreme relief and gladness. Oh, thank goodness you found me. I'm lost. I reckon, answered Jonathan grimly. The settlement's only five hundred yards over that hill. I was going the wrong way. Oh, suppose you hadn't come, exclaimed Helen, sinking on a log and looking up at him with warm, glad eyes. How did you lose your way? Jonathan asked. He saw neither the warmth in her eyes nor the gladness. I went up the hillside only a little way, after flowers, keeping the fort in sight all the time. Then I saw some lovely violets down a little hill, and thought I might venture. I found such loads of them I forgot everything else and I must have walked on a little way. On turning to go back, I couldn't find the little hill. I have hunted in vain for the clearing. It seems as if I have been wandering about for hours. I'm so glad you found me. Weren't you told to stay in a settlement inside the clearing? demanded Jonathan. Yes, replied Helen, with her head up. Why didn't you? Because I didn't choose. You ought to have better sense. It seems I hadn't. Helen said quietly, but her eyes belied that calm voice. "'You're a headstrong child,' added Jonathan curtly. "'Mr. Zane!' cried Helen with pale face. "'I suppose you've always had your own sweet will, but out here on the border you ought to think a little more of others, if not yourself.' Helen maintained a proud silence. "'You might have run right into prowling Shawnees.' "'That dreadful disaster would not have caused you any sorrow,' she flashed out. "'Of course it would. I might have lost my scalp trying to get you back home,' said Jonathan, beginning to hesitate. Plainly he did not know what to make of this remarkable young woman. "'Such a pity to have lost all your fine hair,' she answered with a touch of scorn. Jonathan flushed, perhaps for the first time in his life. If there was anything he was proud of, it was his long, glossy hair. "'Miss Helen, I'm a poor hand at words,' he said, with a pale, grave face. "'I was only speaking for your own good.' "'You are exceedingly kind, but need not trouble yourself.' "'Say,' Jonathan hesitated, looking half-vexed at the lovely, angry face. Then an idea occurred to him. Well, I won't trouble. Find your way home yourself. Abruptly she turned and walked slowly away. He had no idea of allowing her to go home alone, but believed it might be well for her to think so. If she did not call him back, he would remain near at hand, and when she showed signs of anxiety or fear, he could go to her. Helen determined she would die in the woods, or be captured by Shawnees, before calling him back. But she watched him. Slowly the tall, strong figure, with its graceful, springy stride, went down the glade. He would be lost to view in a moment, and then she would be alone. How dark it had suddenly become! The gray cloak of twilight was spread over the forest, and in the hollows night already had settled down. A breathless silence pervaded the woods. "'I'm lonely,' thought Helen, with a shiver. Surely it would be dark before she could find the settlement. What hill hid the settlement from view? She did not know, could not remember, which he had pointed out. Suddenly she began to tremble. She had been so frightened before he had found her, and so relieved afterward, and now he was going away. Mr. Zane! she cried with a great effort. Come back! Jonathan kept slowly on. Come back! Jonathan, please! The borderman retraced his trip. "'Please take me home,' she said, lifting her face, all flushed, tear-stained, and marked with traces of storm. "'I was foolish and silly to come into the woods, and so glad to see you. But you spoke to me in a way no one ever used before. I'm sure I deserved it. Please take me home. Papa will be worried.' Softer eyes and voice than hers never entreated man. Come, he said gently, and, taking her by the hand, he led her up the ridge. 
Thus they passed through the darkening forest, hand in hand, like a dusky redman and his bride. He helped her over stones and logs, but still held her hand when there was no need of it. She looked up to see him walking, so dark and calm beside her, his eyes ever roving among the trees. Deepest remorse came upon her because of what she had said. There was no sentiment for him in this walk under the dark canopy of the leaves. He realized the responsibility. Any tree might hide a treacherous foe. She would atone for her sarcasm, she promised herself, while walking ever conscious of her hand in his, her bosom heaving the sweet, undeniable emotion which came knocking at her heart. Soon they were out of the thicket, and on the dusty lane. A few moments of rapid walking brought them within sight of the twinkling lights of the village, and a moment later they were at the lane, leading to Helen's home. Releasing her hand, she stopped him with a light touch and said, "'Please don't tell Papa or Colonel Zane.' "'Child, I ought. Someone should make you stay at home.' "'I'll stay. Please don't tell. It'll worry Papa.' Jonathan Zane looked down into her great, dark, wonderful eyes with an unaccountable feeling. He really did not hear what she asked. Something about that upturned face brought to his mind a rare and perfect flower, which grew in far-off rocky fastness. The feeling he had was intangible, like no more than a breath of fragrant western wind, faint with tidings of some beautiful field. Promise me you won't tell? Well, lass, have it your own way, replied Jonathan wonderingly, conscious that it was the first pledge ever asked of him by a woman. Thank you. Now we have two secrets, haven't we? She laughed with eyes like stars. Run home now, lass. Be careful hereafter. I do fear for you with such spirit and temper. I'd rather be scalped by Shawnees than have Bing Leggett so much as set eyes on you. You would? Why? Her voice was like low, soft music. Why? he mused. It had seemed like a buzzard about to light on a doe. Good night, said Helen. Abruptly and wheeling, she hurried down the lane. End of chapter 7